Turn with me in the scripture this morning to uh, James, the first chapter. James 1 and verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations, trials, and tests. Now, if it always felt like joy, you wouldn't have to count it all joy. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Your faith being tried works patience. I say it like this sometimes, time tries trust. Trust is another word for faith. Confidence is another word for faith. We, we have confidence in God and in His Word. We're fully assured in, about God and what He has said and what He can do. We trust Him and what He said and what He can do. Well, time tries that trust. When days pass, weeks pass, months pass, years pass, and you don't see what He said happening. You don't feel it, you don't, you don't experience it, that's going to try your faith. That's going to test it. Hmm? And sometimes people say, well, yeah, you know, I tried that faith stuff and it didn't work. No, you said that wrong. It tried you. <laughs> it tried you and you didn't pass the test. It, it, it proved your faith was deficient because when time passed, your faith didn't stand up to the test of time. If your faith is good and solid, no matter how much time passes, you still believe the same thing. When God says something, is it true? Is it always true? How long will it be true? Then how long should you believe it? <laughs> right? If His Word doesn't change and He doesn't change, our believing shouldn't change. It's people that change, not Him. It's people's faith that fails, that quits, not His faithfulness. He's always faithful, no matter if somebody believes or not. It goes on to say, verse 3, Knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. What is it going to say? But let patience... Have her perfect work, complete work, that you may be perfect or complete and entire, wanting nothing. Is patience important? Yes. Does it render benefits in your life? Yes. If you'll let patience have its complete work in you, you'll wind up in the best shape you've ever been in. Amen. You'll wind up complete, yes. wanting nothing. What does it mean, wanting nothing? People ask you about, well, how are you doing in that area? Man, I don't want a thing. Got everything. Got everything I need and then some. What about that area? You need some more? No, we got, we got everything. How about this area? Don't need a thing. Got everything. What got you there? Faith and patience. Somebody said out loud, faith, faith and, and patience. Patience. You really don't have any more faith than you do patience. When your patience runs out, that's also the end of your faith. It's not enough just to believe God. You got to believe God until. <laughs> until what? Until it happens, until you see it. You, you've, you've received it on the inside, you count it done, but until you see it and experience it out here, you stay in faith. You don't quit. You don't give up. Can you say amen? In uh, Hebrews, if you go over there, Hebrews the sixth chapter, the twelfth verse, Hebrews six twelve. He said that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What's the alternative? To standing strong and being steadfast in faith and persevering. Well, it's being lazy. 
slothful. It's easier just to give up and quit than it is to keep believing God, isn't it? When, it, when it's time keeps passing and, and, and contradictions to your faith, and it looks like you're worse than you were when you started off, the easy thing is to throw up your hands and quit or to invent a new doctrine <laughs> that it must not be God's will for some mysterious reasons, which millions have done. That's the the easy, lazy, slothful way out. But through faith and patience, you get it. You inherit. Hallelujah. Verse 13, when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. What does that let you know? If God couldn't find anybody any greater, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> in, in Isaiah and, and, and Ezekiel, different places, he talks about how God is almighty, how he knows the end from the beginning. He's, he knows everything. And then he says, uh, is there any other God? He says, I know not of any. <laughs> well, he just got through saying he knows everything. Right, it's a God joke. <laughs> God is funny. He really is. He's funny. He's amazingly. He's the life of the party. Literally. And uh, if he says he doesn't know of any, any other God, what does that mean? There ain't none. Right? <laughs> he, because he, he could swear by no greater, he couldn't find anybody else. He swore by himself because he's as big as it gets. There's nobody above him. Amen. Nobody beyond him. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Aren't you glad to call him yeah. Abba? Yeah. Yeah. Daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. The biggest one in the universe yeah. is my daddy. Yeah. Ho. Yeah. That'll preach. Yeah. That's shouting ground. Yeah. Isn't it? Come on, say it out loud. The creator of the universe. The, of the, universe. the biggest one there's ever been. It's my daddy. It's my daddy. It's my daddy. It's my daddy. <laughs> Next time the devil tries to mess with you, you say, Do you know who my daddy is? <laughs> you know who you're messing with? <laughs> Put him on the run. <laughs> what, keep reading. When God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, Surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so the next day, it happened. Huh? The next week, it happened. The next year. Five years later, it came to pass. Ten years later, it came to pass. The answer is no. Twenty years later, it came to pass. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Only 25 years later plus when he's almost 100, right, was Isaac born, seeming impossibility. When did it happen? After he had what? Patiently endured. Did those 25 years while he and her are getting older and older and older and older and time is passing, did that try their trust? Oh, yes, it did. Yes, it did. You know, they decided at one point, this is not going to happen the conventional way. So Sarah had an idea. Right? Right? And they had an Ishmael, hmm? which still wasn't God's plan. You got to watch about trying to help God out. <laughs> I said, you got to watch about trying to help God out. You know, how can you identify trying to help God out? You're going to take care of it so it doesn't require a miracle. 
Oh God, don't be concerned about, you know, that miracle. I, I, I can take care of that. <laughs> well, you can, but it's going to be a problem the rest of your life. And it's still not going to be what God told you. No, after he had what? Patiently endured, he got it. She got it. They obtained the promise. Can you say amen? amen. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. How are you going to do it? How am I going to do it? Same way, through faith and patience. Now notice in that 12th verse again, I want you to notice this. It says, verse 12, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Followers. Followers. You know, Paul said, I don't know, three or four times in the New Testament, follow me. Be followers of me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow, here it says, be followers of who? Those who through faith and patience, be followers of faith and patience people. Our influences are making a bigger difference in our lives than we realize. It's only when they are removed that we find out their true impact. And God has given gifts to men. He's given people in our lives, uh, elders, uh, family, friends, ministers, fellow believers that have faith and patience. And these people are affecting our world. They are affecting our environment. And they're, they're swaying us to have more faith. They're swaying us, they're influencing us to have greater patience. Can you look back in your life and see times when if it wasn't for this person or that person and their faith and their patience, you, you might have quit. Hmm? You might have changed when you shouldn't have changed. You might have gone a different direction. You might have given up and stopped endeavoring to stand or believe. But, but their faith and their patience inspired greater faith in you and greater patience in you. And so you didn't quit and you stayed with it and you got something that God intended for you to have. Can you say amen? amen. Follow them. He said, everybody said out loud, follow, follow them. Hebrews 13, 7, Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember them that have the rule over you, who've spoken to you the word of God, whose faith, do what? Follow, considering a looking to the end of their conversation. Follow them. The scripture says, you know, there are numerous passages, but 1 Corinthians, I guess it's 15, 33. Put that up for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be deceived, he says, evil communications corrupt good manners. What does that mean? Communications that has to do with fellowship and companionship. Good manners have to do also with manners is kind of a, a loose translation. Morals is a good word to use here. Good morals. Good standard. Do the people around you have an influence on you? Oh, they do. More than you like to admit. More than you like to think. If it's good, that's great. If it's bad, they're still influencing you too. Something's happening when we spend a lot of time with people. Either we're influencing them or they're influencing us or some of both, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to think about this. Whatever we follow is what we're going to find. Whoever they are, whatever they are, that's what you're going to be. The people you follow, the people you fellowship with, because what's in them is going to get in you. 
Hmm? Fellowship, communion. A perfect picture of it is having a meal together. Communion means sharing, fellowshipping, same thing. If we all sit down and, we, and there's beans and taters and bread on the table and we're all eating together, okay, cornbread. <laughs> you don't have to ask me twice. I'm, I'm a cornbread boy. <laughs> uh, if we all eat together, then there's beans and taters and cornbread on the table, and if we're all eating together, what are all of us going to wind up having in us? The, the same thing, because we're all eating from the same table, and so I'm going to wind up with beans and taters and cornbread in me, and you're going to wind up with beans and taters and cornbread in you. Because we're eating at the same table. That's communion. That's sharing. And whatever's in our leaders and whatever's in the people that God, is, God has joined us with, He intended that for good, right? That we wind up getting in us what He put in them. But the enemy intends to get you around some folks that's got some things in them that you don't need in you. But if you choose to fellowship with them and more than you do the other folks, you're going to wind up with that bad stuff in you, whether you intend to or not. Because you're eating at the same table, dipping out of the same bowls. Right? <laughs> well, this is exciting today, isn't it? <laughs> Go with me, please, over to the, uh, let's see, go to Judges 2, and I'll just uh, condense some things for us a little bit, and then we'll read the Scripture. We studied a few weeks ago when we talked about what happens when you get tired of waiting, and we saw that Moses had been given, uh, was being given the law, the tablets of stone written with God's finger, and he's gone just a few weeks, and the people went off the deep end and, and made, them some, made them a gold calf and said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. And it hadn't been just a matter of weeks that they heard the voice of God coming out of the fire from the mountain telling them, you shall have no other gods before me. You don't make any graven image. And they all said, oh, God is God. God is God. Don't let him talk to us again. It's too awesome. We'll die. And weeks later, somebody say weeks later. Weeks later. Weeks later. <laughs> They say, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. He's been gone nearly two months. We don't know what happened to him. We need a new God. So let's make us an image and worship another God. Now, why would that be the first thing they thought of? They had help. The devil is whispering that in people's ear, trying to get them to violate the very thing God just got through telling them to do. That's how he works. Have you ever felt the pressure to do something wrong? Don't look at me so innocent. <laughs> it just keeps coming, just keeps coming, just keep the thoughts just keep coming. Well, why? It's the devil. It He's pushing you. He He's pressing you, yeah. trying to get you to do the very thing God told you not to do. Mm -hmm. Why that thing? Because that's what God told you not to do. <laughs> and... Uh, just stay where you are in, in, in Judges. Exodus 32, verse 8, he said, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. How did they do this? They did this when Moses was removed from them for just a few weeks. They ran off the tracks, showing how much influence he had in their lives. His faith and his commitment and his relationship and walk with God 
was having an influence over those millions of the tribes of Israel. And as long as he was there and in charge, they were, they were moving ahead, they were observing the commandments, but he's gone for less than two months. And they have slipped back into idolatry, which showed their heart and their faith. Are y'all listening, saints? Deuteronomy 31, he said this to them before he died. He's a prophet, and he knew this by the Spirit. It said in Deuteronomy 31, 25, Moses commanded the Levites. He said, take the book of the law, put it in the Ark of the Covenant. It'll be a witness against you. Verse 27, I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you, you've been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Why would it be so much more after his death? Because his, his influence is not there anymore. And so he said, he said, you've been rebellious while I've been with you. And after, after my death, and he went on to say what was going to happen. He, say, I, he said, I know after my death you'll corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way that I commanded you, and evil will befall you. It's always been this way. It is still this way. In the book of Acts in the New Testament, I want you to look over there with me. Hold your place in Judges. In the book of Acts, the 20th chapter, I know some of this is sobering, but why would the Lord be talking to us about it? Because He doesn't want us separated from the, the right influences, right? And he wants us to stand and have our own faith if and when we no longer have those influences. Because by, by right of the term, elder indicates older, indicates previous generation, which means if things go as they should, they're going to go home before you do. Which means there's going to come a time when they're not in your life. Hmm? Not might. There is coming a time when their faith and their being led and their walk with God is not creating a current. And some people's walk and faith is so strong that the current can kind of just catch folks and pull them in with them. Like a strong current. People that love God, and it, even to a small degree, they get around them and they get pulled in. But what about when they're not there? When they're not there, then we find out if you have faith. We find out if you have a relationship with God for yourself, if you know Him, if your commitment is there without Him. And every one of us have already or are going to find that out. You're going to find that out. Thank God for the gifts that the Lord puts in our life. They're more precious than we know. It's easy to take them for granted while they're there. You get used to it, especially year after year, decade after decade. People even, they get, they get worse than used to it. They, they, get, they act like they deserve it. Like, like their influence is owed to them, which is dangerous because anything you stop appreciating, you're in danger of losing. Did you know that? When you no longer treasure it, you're close to losing it. But even, even when you do treasure and value it, there's going to come a time when they're not there. That's the way it's supposed to be. And God's going to allow a time where you're left to yourself to show what's in your heart. Will you stand without them? You know, the Bible said concerning Jesus, the night they took him, he quoted from the scripture that said that, that the shepherd was going to be smitten and the flock was going to be what? Scattered. And they were doing great as long as they were with him. Right? Man, they're believing. They're casting out devils. They're healing the sick. 
They're preaching like a house of fire. And when he was pulled out, what happened to them? Man, they were scared. They ran. They hid. Peter, supposed to be one of the strongest ones, stood out there and denied that he even knew him. Didn't he? Because of not having, they, do you think they didn't realize what kind of strong influence Jesus was having on them? Just being with them? No, they didn't fully appreciate that. But, thank God they found their footing. Amen. Didn't they? They found their bearing. And they did, you know, did you hear what they said? We're going fishing. What does that mean? They've been in the ministry for years. They're not just saying we're going to go for a fishing today. They're going back to what they used to do. And so many times you'll see that when strong spiritual influences that have people's lives have been totally changed, if and when they're removed, people will go back to what they were and were doing previous to finding out more about the Lord. And you find out where their faith is without these other folks. Interesting, don't you think? Paul said in Acts 20, verse 29, he told them, he called the elders together. He said, I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. When's it going to happen? When? Why after? Because as long as he's there, He's not going to let it go that way. He's not going to let it go that way. He's going to shut people down. He's going to put them out. There's a whole lot of folks that just, they know not to try certain things with certain people. <laughs> they know it ain't go, it's not going anywhere. They know they'll never get it going. But if and when they're gone, they know there's opportunity now because these other folks are weak and will give in, and will let them do what they want to do. And that's when things start going off the tracks. What do you say? Keep reading verse 30. Also of your own selves. Who's he talking to? <laughs> He's talking to the preachers mm -hmm. yeah. that came up under him. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things and drawing away disciples after them getting into error, leading people astray. Who? His preachers. His ministers. When's it going to happen? When he's gone. Can you see this? This is such an important principle. Why would the Lord talk to us about this? One, value your God-given influences. They're a treasure. I said they're a treasure. Never act like it's owed to you. Never take it for granted. Every day is precious. Every opportunity is precious. Do you believe it? Every service is precious. Every meeting is precious. Every message is precious. Do you believe it, saints? And also get ready for the time when they're not there. Because it's coming. You said, don't say that. Don't be scared. Be a man. Amen. Be a woman of God. Be a man of God. You might know what I'm talking about. Yes. Get ready to stand on your own. There's coming a time Amen. when you're, need to go to, you're going to need to stand up and take some spiritual leadership yeah. and take some responsibility. Right. And no matter what these folk do or don't do, you're not going to lose your faith. Right. And you're not going to go back into sin and jump. Right? right? right. You know him for yourself. You're going to stand no matter what anybody else does. And what happens is that transition occurs. You become the spiritual influence in other people's lives in your generation. Oh, this is a glorious thing. Can you see this? You become that father or mother in the faith. That person that's creating a spiritual wake. That's drawing people in. Hallelujah. That when you're around, poor people were timid and thinking about quitting. They hang around you for a little bit and they decide, I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. 
I'm not backsliding. I'm not going back into the world. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to run my race. And just being around you influenced that. Because that's who you are. That's what you are. And you got to become that without other people. You got to know him for yourself. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Whoo. And preach myself happy. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, man. I felt like I just touched on this today. Go to John 8 in closing, I think. Thanks be unto God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. John 8, verse 12. Judges 2 will have to be for another time. <laughs> I tell you what, read it carefully for yourself. See what, see what you think about it. Be some in interesting things there. What we see is influences and how powerful they are. The devil's trying to influence people. He's doing everything he can to influence people in this generation. But thank God the Holy Spirit is influencing people. Isn't he? The Word of God in us, the Spirit of God in us and on us is influencing people through us. Hallelujah. Said out loud, by God in me, I'm a force for good. I'm a force for good. <laughs> well, you know what I mean by that? You are, you are not swayed by unbelief. You are not swayed by evil. You are a force for good. And when you come in, people know. Ain't no need in trying to talk them out of it. I either go with them or shut up. <laughs> right? Either hook up or get out of the way. No. We're not, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices, and we're not going his way. Not now, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. We're going all the way with the one that called us, loved us, saved us. Can you say amen? amen. John 8, 12, what did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall what? What if you're following him? Huh? He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Why are you going to have the light of life? Because you're with the light and life. Come on, can you see this? Because you're with him. You can't be in the dark because he's light. When he gets there, it's not dark. Right? Because right. you never have to turn on the light because you're with the light. You're with the light. You read in the book of Revelation where in the future and the heavenly city comes down, we won't need a sun. We won't have a star. We won't need it because God lives with us. And the Lamb is the light. There won't even be any night there. You won't need any light because you live with the light. <laughs> you find what you follow. Did you hear that phrase? If you're following Jesus, what are you going to find? You're following light, you're going to find light. You're going to live in light. If you're why did he tell us follow those? Their faith, their patience. Why? If you're following faith and you're following patience, what are you going to find? You're going to find faith and you're going to find patience. Right? And where you used to be so impatient and so quick to change and quick to quit and quick to give up, you're going to let that influence come into you and it's going to help calm you down. Where you might have been quick to be in unbelief and fear, you're going to let that influence affect you. You're going to let it affect you. Somebody say, yield to it. Yield. yield to the faith. Yield to the patience. And you will become strong like that. 
And in process of time, even though you were such a minute person and so quick to give up and so quick to change, you will become the one who is the force for faith and patience in somebody else's life. Come on, can you see it, brothers and sisters? You will sway them to not quit, to not give up, to stand and believe God no matter what. Can you say amen? amen? Stand up on your feet, everybody. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to the great and mighty and good God. Hallelujah. Say it out loud because you mean it, Father God. I thank you sincerely. Heartfelt thanks for all the godly influences you have put in my life from my birth until now. Thank you for every man, every woman, every person that you used to influence me. Thank you. And I will keep my eyes open and value what you're doing today. And I say by your grace, in time to come, when those influences are no longer with me, I will not quit you. I will not fail. I will still trust you and I will still follow you and I pray that you will make me an influence in the lives of others to your glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.